welcome back. For today, I want to put together all the things that we have been reviewing in the past three, four weeks. Today, if I make a summary of the things that you know, uh, we have been reviewing statements, the statements, the lines that you put inside of the methods. So far, we are playing with the main method. All the statements that we're reviewing, you put those statements in the main method, but you know that you can put them inside of any method. So what kind of statements you know? What kind of sentence you can put in your program? Uh, as today, you know how to use variables. We have been playing with local variables. Most of our programs have local variables. When we move to global, it's going to be the same. The main idea is you know how to create variables. And you know the different types of variables with numbers, floating point numbers, string, characters, and so on the statements that you use to store value. Then we review some instructions. Uh, obviously, you know the println. I am going to use only the name of the method, but system out println. You know how to print something on the screen. You know how to ask the user for something. Uh, the option pane, And again, I am not writing everything, the packages. I am not including the things inside of the parentheses. Just for you to remember. We review the instructions for mathematical uh, operations, for particular mathematical background. We review all this math dot and a lot of things there. Pow, square root, sine, cosine, and more. In fact, we review the concept of libraries. Uh, packages. At this point, if I ask you to do a program and you need to do something special, you know that maybe the first thing that you need to do is to go and search for a particular instruction inside of a particular package part of the library that maybe help you to solve the problem that you want to solve. Libraries, packages, methods, instructions, training, input dialogue, all the math. On the other side, we review that we do not need to run all the instructions inside of a method. We can change the control flow of the program. We start with something simple and we review how to create two paths for the execution of the program. Like I want this instruction to run or this other. So only one of those two, I create two paths, if else. We review then that we can put if else inside of if else. So you can create more paths and you can end with a branch, like a three different paths. And in some point they are going to come together. Uh, obviously, if else is not the only option, we review uh, switch and we talk about this question mark operator. We're not using the question mark operator, but we're going to play with if else and switch. Uh, something that we talk a lot is you can use one or the other. You can achieve similar results with one or the other. You can replace one for the other and vice versa is basically the one that you feel solve the problem that you want to solve. Different ways to express the same idea with different words in the language, different options. The last thing that we review is, well, sometimes what we want to do is to repeat the same instruction several times. 
and we play with something simple, printing things. But the idea is a generic idea. We want to repeat something several times. We have the loops. And for the loops, the last thing that we review, we have this idea of the while, the do while, and the for. I only put the words here, but obviously every time that I mention any of these words, the idea is that now you have in your mind the grammatical structure for that. It's like, okay, after the four parentheses and the elements inside of the parentheses and then the curly brackets and so on. I mean, each of these words represent a structure that hopefully by now you are familiar, you have time to practice, uh, you have been using those structures in different programs alone. So, so far, it's like I have been asking you to do sentence. Your homework have been used for practice these constructions and I have asked you to give me one sentence. I mentioned this before. It's like your homework is uh, the cat is running and ideas like that. What I need to do starting today and next week is let put all these things together and let start doing programs that are a little bit more complex. It's like now you know something about the language. What if I ask you to write something complex? Like this is your class for Spanish, French, Chinese. Well, your homework now is going to be tell me what you did during the weekend. Two pages, three pages. It's like do something more complex putting together all these different elements. Um, I am going to give you an example today and we're going to move in that direction in the following week. So, with these elements, there is only one thing that I need to add here, like bonus point, bonus idea. I am going to do that and then I want to show you an example a full example with all of this. So, going back here, the bonus ideas. Two things that I want to share with you to close these statements that we reviewed before. I am sure that you remember that word, that key, the break. If you remember, you, you use that with the switch. Do you remember for what? switch, case, instructions, and the break is the end of the instructions that correspond to a particular case, right? You just remember that, the end of a particular case. Okay, you know what? You can use that word inside of a loop. You can put break inside of a loop. And you know what is going to happen? The loop is going to break, is going to stop. What? Yeah. Very, very simple. For loop, just because we reviewed this yesterday. Do you remember that example? It's a loop. How many times is it going to run? Oh. No condition, no initialization, no increment, whatever, right? One instruction inside, break. You know how many times this one is going to run? One. Why one? Because I am running my program, I am checking the condition, no condition is true, I go down, and this instruction break jump outside of the for loop. The instruction break is go out of this loop. 
Yes, I know, you are thinking like, why are you going to put a break inside of a loop just like you did here, if that means that that loop is not going to be a loop because it's going to go out immediately? Well, you'd never put a break alone because that is what is going to happen. But if I go back to my example, something that we usually do is inside of a loop, we can put a condition and then inside of that condition, we can put a break. So we have a loop, inside of the loop, we can have a condition and if that condition is true and if we run the break, the loop go out. Really? Yeah. One example. This example that I have here. In normal circumstances, and according with our lecture yesterday, the program go down, is a four, it's going to do this, I is a box, is one, it's going to review the condition, I lower or equal to 100, if that one is true, it's going to go down. It's going to do everything that is inside. And then it's going to go back here. It's going to read this. And then again, the condition. Usually, you can expect that this loop run how many times? Ignore the instructions inside. Use reading this, the loop is supposed to run from one to 100. Oh wait, but the increment is plus two. So could you agree with me that what I am doing here is a loop that is going to be running 50 times. One to 100, but the increment is plus two. So it's one, three, five, and you can continue. So that means half of the 100, more or less. Makes sense. So usually without the instructions that I am going to describe later, you have a loop that your original plan is to run 50 times, according with what we reviewed yesterday, according with the structure. Here. However, inside of the loop, what I have is well, this instruction print. As usual, I am printing things because I want to show you what is happening. And as you notice, just like I described, the print is printing one, three, five, and so on, right? Because it's printing the value for the variable. But then I put this E inside of the four. Remember, inside of the four, you can put any instruction that you want, any instruction, so any of these ones that we described before. The if can be inside of the for. That for can be inside of another for. The for can be inside of an if or inside of a switch. The combinations are anything that you want to do. That is the point in which programming becomes interesting. Right? So going back here, I have this condition. Uh, Do we understand the condition? I am using the same variable that I am printing. And I am asking if that variable percentage 15 is equal zero. Can we agree that when the variable was 15, percentage 15, that was equal to zero. That was true. When that condition was true or is true, the condition run this instruction. Notice, the break is inside of the if. No, nothing happened. The one that suffers the consequences is the loop. Because when you execute a break inside of a loop, again, what is going to happen is that break is going to put the execution of the program outside of that loop. I don't care about the if is this break is going to move the execution of this program here. And the important thing is 
we don't care about the value of the variable. We don't care about the instructions that we're running. We don't care about anything. You read break and the break instruction is like, go out immediately, period. That is what happens when you put a break inside of a loop. You need to be careful because again, if you want to stop the loop, it's a very powerful instruction. But if that is not what you want to do, usually you're going to put a condition, just like in this example, just because maybe you want to stop the loop, but only under some circumstances, not always. If you stop the loop always, uh, you have a loop that is going to run only one time, which is not really useful. Make sense? As usual, my recommendation, run this example. See what happens if you remove the if. Review that is true, that this one is going to run only one time. Change the if. Question for your exam. What could happen if I change the condition for something like If I equal equals zero, break. I just delete the other element. How many times is going to run this program? Which are going to be the numbers that are going to be printed as an output? Can you figure out what is going to happen? The if is going to be true sometimes? Hopefully, it will be exactly that if. It's going to be false always. I mean, never, 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 the i is going to be zero, right? I mean, they start with one, and it's going to increment plus two. Never is going to be true. So the break never is going to run. The loop is going to run 50 times. And I am going to print at the end 99, probably. And then it's going to stop with the 101. That is what we're going to happen. Now, is an error? Because I have a break that is going to be executed never. And I have a condition that is going to be false forever. I mean, never true. Is an error? Not really. Is not exactly a good program. It's not exactly something that you want to have. But again, what we're doing is crazy things for you to know what elements you have available in the language. Uh, think about this, like you writing a paper in English, even, you're native, even if you're native speakers, but sometimes we put things in the paper that are redundant or unclear, or we are not able to explain ourselves. Uh, maybe this is the kind of thing that happen when you do programming, right? It's like, oh, okay, sorry, I put a condition that is going to be false always. Anyway. But again, right now, my concern is that you understand what happened even if I put those kind of crazy conditions. And as you mentioned, this is going to never run if I change the condition like I did. Good. So another one, this is break. You knew break from the switch. This is what happened when you put break in a for loop. Uh, the same idea happened if you put the break in a while or in a do while. The break ends a loop. Doesn't matter which one. So you can use the breaks inside of the loop. Another one. There is another word that I want you to memorize and it's continue. And this word, keyword, can be used inside of any loop. I have a for loop. Um, I'm going to have a variable. I am going to have a condition. Um, I am going to use our new, new operator. Remember, we reviewed yesterday x plus plus. 
x equal x plus one. Um, as usual. The room is not that one, right? This one is going to print the numbers um, zero to nine or one to 10. Zero to nine, right? Okay, good, well, you're checking. Uh, what happened if I put A continue there. Continue is an instruction that is going to ask the program to go back to the condition. So in this example, my program starts here. I read the port. I read the initialization. I read the condition. My program go down. In any point in which I read continue, this continue is going to go back. Do you remember that this go back usually happen when you read this closing curly bracket of the fourth? Continue is the equivalent of this closing curly bracket. Hmm. Okay, so according with that, if continue is equivalent to that closing curly bracket, then what is going to happen in this program with that continue? I go here, go here, go here, check the condition, go down. This continue is asking me to go back here, do the increment, do the condition. The loop is going to be there. I am going to print something? Nothing, right? Again, think about that continue like, go back to check the condition. So everything below the continue is not executed. Why do you want to do that? Well, sometimes, I want to do something like this printing, but a condition did you notice you like with the break those two words Usually it's a bad idea to use them alone, but they work very well if you put an if before, because then you can execute that particular instruction only in some cases, not always. So in the previous case, if I always execute continue, the print is never executed. What's happening in this program now? What is going to be the output for this program? Mm -hmm. Hopefully you agree with me. This program is going to execute the continue only when the variable is equal to five, which means that when the variable is equal to five, the print is not going to be executed. The program is going to print on the screen. Zero, one, two, three, four, not the five, and six, seven, um, So, in some cases, this break and continue can be useful. Which cases? Depending on the problem that you are solving. They are tools. You do not need to use the tools every time. You use the tools that you need to solve the particular problem. If you need a hammer, you use the hammer. Maybe you never use the hammer, depending what you are doing. So, the continue do not break the loop. 
the continue, just go back to check the condition. I read continue and I go back, just like when I found the closing curly bracket. So, break, stop the loop, continue, just go back to check the condition again, ignoring the instruction that followed. Those are the two words, new words, that I want you to add to your toolbox and remember them when you are working with loops. Break and continue. Good? We're going to use them in examples, but this example, the previous one, this one, run them in your computers and be sure that you understand what is happening. Here, uh, just to complete the example, I have this loop. Inside of the loop, I have one instruction, two instructions, three instructions, four instructions, four things that I am doing inside of the loop. My loops are becoming bigger, right? I mean, we start with these loops that only have one print inside. Now I have three prints and I have an if inside of the for loop. Originally, this for loop rule from one to four. Notice that we have this lower or equal. So if I think about this one, it's running one to four. Sorry about this thing here. This I plus plus. I am going to uh, talk about the plus equal layer. So incrementing one. This four is going to run with the variable one, two, three, and also with the four because I have the lower or equal, right? The four is included. So this print here is the one that is printing one, two, three, and four. It's printing the, varia the value for the variable. Good. Then I have this print printing a string before before, 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 four times before. But then I have this condition, just like in my previous example, and I am checking variable percentage to equal, equal, zero. Do you remember what is the meaning of this condition? When this condition is true? Something about a number divided by two and Zero is uh -huh. even numbers, exactly. So what the condition is telling me is if you have a number that is uh, even, then execute the instruction continue. What is going to happen if you execute the instruction continue? From this point, you jump back to the condition. You'd like if you have the closing curly bracket. The result is that you're not going to be able to run the full instruction because you are jumping back. Let's review the result. When the variable of the variable, when the value of the variable is one, I am printing after which basically mean that the condition was false, continue was not executed, the program go down, do this print, and here is the point in which the program returned. Now, the next time I print the two, I print before, and you notice that here, the after is missing. And the reason because it's missing is because for the two, the condition is true. And because the condition is true, you execute continue. And because you execute continue, you were not able to run the instruction below continue. For the three, you print after again, the condition was false. For the four, the condition is true again, and after is missing again. So what do I have here? I want you to print all the numbers one to four, could be one to 10. 
but I want you to do something, something specific for the numbers that are even and something else for the numbers that are odd. Or maybe I have some instructions that I do not want to be executed if some particular condition happens. I still want to have this loop, but some instructions, the last one maybe, they are only for some cases, not for others. What you can do is to put a continue above those lines and make that continue be executed under a particular condition that move you back to the top. So the instruction below, like this print after, never run under a particular condition. Again, tools for your toolbox. Continue and break. They work with loop. Good? Hopefully that's okay. Review the example. Okay, now, so far, we are doing programs that the goal is for you to learn a particular statement in the language. We are reviewing keywords, uh, grammatical rules, and the example is used a trivial example that show how to use that particular statement or that particular instruction. I want to change a little bit this and start with a problem. And then from the problem, move to the solution. Let me be clear here. One thing is to learn the tools. And a different thing is to know how to use the tools. Uh, you can learn a language, but the skills for writing a novel or a book using that language is a different story. You can learn how to use a hammer, but asking you to build a house or something using those tools is a different story. Programming have the same idea. At this point, you know the tool loops, conditions, instructions, libraries. Developing the skills to use those tools to solve a particular problem is creativity, is a skill that you need to be proficient and basically it's about practice. So let me show you one idea about what to do to solve problems using the tools that you know. Uh, at this point, I am showing you the slide with the tic-tac-toe. Uh, did you know the game? I mean, I select this one because I want to assume that we are all familiar with the game, so I do not need to introduce the requirements or what is this about, unless you, uh, someone uh, want me to uh, talk about it. Uh, We agree that this again is a game for two people. Uh, usually, you have a table with nine spaces. One of the people, one of the players, uh, use X usually, and the other player circle, and one and one, right? I play put my X, someone else, else play, put the circle, and um, we continue and continue. And basically the goal is to complete one line, any place could be a diagonal with the same picture, with X or with circle. If I complete a line with X, I am the winner. If the other player complete a line with circle, then the other player is the winner, right? It's a very simple game. Now, what I would like to ask you is, could we create this game in a program for the computer in a way that I, a user, a human, can be one of the players, but the other player could be the computer. So I want to create a program in which 
I am going to explain or I am going to tell the computer about this game. And at the end, what I am going to have is this program that when I run the program, basically we are going to be able to play. I am going to be able to put my move. The computer is going to do its own move and we're going to be playing until someone win or is uh, no one win and maybe we can play again and again and again until in some point we get tired of this. So, obviously the answer is yes, right? The point is, what do we need? Which of the tools that we know so far are needed to implement something like this? And hopefully you agree with me that in the program that we're going to create, something that is going to be there is a loop. Why a loop? Because if you think about the game, it use the human play and the computer play. Whatever, right? Nine times, maybe. It's a loop, human computer, human computer, and there is a particular condition to stop. I mean, you stop when you use all the places, the nine places, or maybe you stop if you have a winner. It's a loop that is stopped when a particular condition is true. Inside of that, inside of that loop, you somehow need to implement that the user should be able to do a movement. And also you need to be able to implement something for the computer to do a movement. And that's it. Obviously the movement from the user is an easy one. What can you do in a program to ask me where I want to put my mark? Well, you already know that is your option dialog. You just ask me. On the other hand, what do you need for the computer to do a movement? Maybe a lot of conditions, right? I mean, at the end, thinking about a movement is about condition. Condition, if else, if the player move in a particular position, then I need to do something. Else, another condition, a different movement, I need to do something else. If you think about what you do, when you play this game, if you have played this game sometime, the only thing that is happening in your brain is a lot of if, else, if, else, if, else, if, else. You're deciding what to do in these two parts, two parts, two parts, two parts. The user put something at the center, the user put something in the corner, and then you do something. A loop, for sure, condition, for sure. Uh, obviously here, uh, in order to play this game, we need a place in which we can put our zeros and our X. We need a place to store the information. Uh, I am going to play with the computer, so I can ask the computer to keep the information. The only place in which the computer can put the information is in variables. I need variable boxes to store the X or the zero variable. And we know for to create variable. Finally, the computer know the values for the variables, but it's playing with me. I want the computer to show me which variables have which value. I need the computer to show me which spaces are empty. Because the computer has the information in the memory. We need the information to be on the screen. We need a print. We need to print this table on the screen. So the computer has the information, but I can check the information also on the screen. 
and I can do my movement, and the computer can do his movement, and we need condition to define it from one wing. That is the problem. Now, the program. Hopefully, everything that I explained can be summarized in the following first draft for the problem, for the solution. Let's see. Number one, at this point, something that I mentioned is the computer is going to ask me, the user, about what I want to do. If I want to do that, I need this instruction, show input dialog. If I want to use the show input dialog, I need to import a particular library. And that is the reason because I need that type. Second, I am going to do a program. I am going to implement a program and that program is the tic-tac-toe game. So maybe it makes sense to create a new class and why not the name for my class could be this one. And at this point for you to be familiar why I am using uppercase, lowercase in the way that I am doing that. Quick answer to the question in the chat. Yes, the best solution for this, the good solution for this could be to use arrays, in particular 2D arrays, matrices. But that is something that we're going to review in the last week of the class. So what I am going to do today is to solve this with nine variables. But yes, can be a matrix three times three or just one array of nine positions. But I am not assuming that you know about that because for the class, we review that in the week eight. It's a good solution. Well, I am not going to use that solution today, but in four weeks, I am going to present the same problem, but now with a new solution. Yeah. So, tic-tac-toe, one class. Another thing that I am going to do here, and the reason because I am going to do this is to show you that could be a bad idea, is I am going to put the solution for this problem, everything in one method. The only method that I am including here is the main. This is the first time that I hope you notice that having everything in the main is going to create a big main, like having a paper with only one paragraph. And you are going to notice why it's a very good idea to have more than one paragraph, therefore, it's a good idea to have more than one method. And by the way, one of your labs next week is going to improve this program. This one is on the slide, complete, everything on the main. In one of the labs, you're going to be asked to split this main in several methods for the next week. Well, let's solve the problem first. One class, one method. And the only thing that I know right now is that I need to do an initialization of things. What do I mean with initialization? And you notice that these are comments. It's like, I am writing a program, but I am putting my ideas in order. It's like, before I start writing in float variables and so on, the first thing that you need to do is what I need to do, define your steps, define what are your needs. And in this point to develop a tic-tac-toe, I know that the first thing that I need to do, and that is going to be only one time, is somehow I need to create variables. Maybe I do not know yet how many. Well, I mentioned nine variables before. That is the nine that I need to create. Which is going to be the type? Which is going to be the initial value? That is something that I am going to show in the next step. But right now, like, I am going to need to do some kind of initialization. One of the steps. Then, something that I know, because the explanation that I give to you is, I need a loop. I need a loop. Because this game is used again and again and again, user computer, using computer, user computer. A loop. Now, for my loop, I could have the condition empty, 
and worry about the condition later. That is one option. Option two, I am going to put this an infinite loop. It's going to be a loop, it's going to be infinite. Really? No, I am going to use our new instruction break to break this loop. Why are going to use the break? Just because I want to show you an example of the break. If you do not like the break, then you are going to notice that you can remove that through and put there a particular condition. The same condition that I am going to use with the break. Again, it's a language. Two different ways to achieve the same result. Use, use different words. So, an infinite loop. What do I need to have inside of the infinite loop? According with the description before, somehow the user, the human, need to do a movement. Uh, then we need to review if the user won the game, right? I mean, maybe I do my movement and use with whatever I did, I am the winner. Or maybe there are no more spaces to play. I need to check after the user move, if the game can continue. And then, well, if the game can continue, what about now I need to worry for the computer to do a move. And if the computer do the move, then the next step is similar to before, quotation, I need to review if there is a winner or no more spaces and the game need to end. Uh, in any case, after I do my movement and the computer do a movement and we check if the game can continue or not, it could be a good idea to ask the computer to print everything. Let me know in which place the computer moved, right? So I can check the table and think my next move because after the computer print, the loop continue and again, I am going to move, things are going to be checked, computer is going to move, things are going to be checked, print everything and forever, forever, forever until somehow this is done. Hopefully you agree with me that this is the big picture for the tic-tac-toe problem. It's just, just like that. Now, the big question here is, I have six things that I need to do. Six different things. What do I need to do? Which are my instructions to solve those six things? Give me a minute. I am going to show you the solution for each of those six things in different slides. Just remember, whatever I show you regarding with this, if you are going to copy paste the program, copy paste those instructions here inside of this green zone and similar for the other. So let's check. What is this initialize? What do I mean with initialize? This is what I am thinking about initialize. Uh, I am thinking that for the game, I need variables. In particular, I need nine variables. Um, I think that those variables could be characters because you mentioned that you need X and the circle that is kind of an O and maybe white spaces. So the solution that I think I can implement is with nine variables type char. And what I do is char and these are my nine variables. Question for you, why I use char three times? Why I create three variables in each row? Can I create nine variables in only one row? Exactly, thank you. The only reason because I put three variables in each row, the only reason because I put char three times is for you to read this like the table. 
that's it. But you can create your nine variables in one line. Remember, programming is about telling the computer what to do, but also it's very, very important to be sure that our programs can be read by other humans. In this case, for me, it's important because my goal is teach to you how to do this. But even if you are working in a company, you're not programming alone. You need to ensure that your partner, your coworker, is able to read your code because maybe you're working together or you're going to work together. You're going to solve a problem together. Good idea. Anyway, nine variables. I use names for my variables. And what I use as a names is A, B, C, D, and so on. My choice. Again, for those of you that know arrays and things like that, this is the perfect opportunity to use those kind of tools. Please do not use them yet. We need to talk about them later. So if you notice, what I have is nine variables. The name of my variables is just like that, A, B, C, And that thing looks like the table that I need. That's it. Obviously, in the memory, what I have is these nine spaces, but they are not in the memory like this nice table. They are not even aligned. They are nine spaces uh, randomly stored in the memory. But I don't care. I have the name. I can access them with the name. That's it. So, you notice that I am initializing those variables, and that is the reason because I use the name initialization or initialize that. I create my nine variables, and I put inside of them a white space. That basically is going to be this empty space in the tic-tac-toe table. Next, something that I want to do, and remember that I am outside of the loop I am going to print something. I'm just going to let the user know again. And can you imagine what I am doing here with all these prints? Um, hopefully you notice that what I have here is this is a white space plus this is a variable plus this is a bar. Use a bar, a character bar. Variable, character, variable, and these are used a lot of lines. I am using print, used to print something like that, that is the table for the tic tac toe. Uh, I am adding the variable. But the value for the variable is a white space. So what you're going to look on the screen the first time when this is executed is something like this. A collection of white spaces and with the bars, I am trying to do the table for the tic tac -toe. That's it. Now, again, copy paste this and all of those instructions go here. Just imagine that all of those instructions are going to be here in this part. So they are inside of the main, but they are before the do. So all of that before the do. All of that, the initialization and that, that printing is only one time, the first time. Makes sense, right? Now I can move to the do. And inside of the do, the first thing that I want to do is as the user for a movement. I am inside of the do. Can you agree with me that this is going to happen at least one time? It do not make sense that this never happened, right? I mean, I am running the program because I want to play the tic-tac-toe uh, at least one time, the movement of the computer and the user need to happen. It's going to be more times, but at least one for sure. So, initialization done. 
user move. Again, all of this source code is the first thing inside of the do. I use a split in several slides. Inside of the do, what is going to happen? I want to ask the user for the movement. Mm. From the do, right? One. Do you remember what is going to happen with string, option, equal, the option pane, show input dialog, layer? I am asking the user for the movement. One agreement that I have with the user, I mean, part of the rule, the, the user manual for the game, is user, when I ask you for your movement, give me a number. Tell me a number, one to nine, and I am going to assume that you want to use that space to move. That's it. So this one, if I follow that rule, if I follow that uh, instruction for the user, well, I can be sure that when I ask the user for the movement in this line, the user is going to give me a number, and that number is going to be one to nine, something like that. I could ask for a letter. I could ask the user to give me the letter that correspond to the name of the variable, but let's play with number. Integer parsing, because I need to transform the string to numbers. So this option is going to be used as an input and at the end I have this move and that move is a number. And that number is something that you can use in a switch. Remember, switch for many. This is practically a menu. I mean, we're not doing graphical interfaces, we're using only text, but you ask the user for a movement, the user is going to give you a number, the number represents one of the spaces in the memory, one of the variables. And in this case, I have one case for each of the possible options that the user can give me. Now, there is always a user that do not understand the instruction. So if you have this user that is going to give you, ah, I want to play in the position 100, it's always a good idea to have this default, right? And default is used. Remember that user fail, I have this variable here, use a volume variable that I'm going to describe later. But in like, by default, the user make a mistake. But if the user give me numbers one to nine, then what I need to do, you can imagine this is, okay, I have the game. If the user give me a number that correspond to a position that is empty, the user can play there. But just imagine what happened if the computer already play here and the user want to use that position. I need to validate that, right? I mean, I need to be sure that whatever is the number that the user give me is the number for a position that is empty. Ah, okay. If the user give me a three, the user want to play in the position three. Did you notice what is happening there? Inside of a switch. The switch was to review the selection of the user. Okay, you select three. Now, inside of three, I have a condition. I need to review that the position three is empty. Okay, what is the position three? The variable C. I need to review that the variable C is empty. Oh, what happened if you select the position two? The position two is the variable B, or the position one is the variable A. The number, the only change is each of the numbers correspond to a different variable. And what I do is to review that the variable is empty. Well, not empty, that the variable has as a value, the equal equal, a white space. Remember, the variable is a character. So what I am reviewing is the character stored in the variable is the white space. And if you remember in initialization, we put white spaces in all the variables. So the first time that the player 
rule if you play the game, the first time all the variables are empty. The first time the player is going to be able to select any position, but that is going to change later. And remember, we are inside of a loop. So this code is going to be executed several times. The first time everything is empty, but the next time there are movement. Whatever the user did, whatever the computer did, so there are some spaces that are not anymore available. So if the condition is true and the space is empty in any of the cases, what I am going to do is to put an X in the variable that corresponds to the user selection. Why an X? Well, my user is the one playing with the X, the computer is going to play with the circle. Give my choice. The user select a position. I am reviewing that the position is empty and I am storing an X in that position. Therefore, I am eliminating the white space. User fail is false. Notice that in all the cases, if the space was empty, if I change the value for an X, the user fail is false. Everything fine with the user. Select a valid number and also a space that is valid and is empty. And then all the breaks. That means that I only execute one of the ifs, the one to correspond to the number that the user selects. I have this do. And that do end with this y. Did you notice the condition? User fail is true. What is the initial value for user fail at the top? False, right? No value, false. That is the default. We need to remember that. So by default, this condition should be false and therefore this loop only run one time. But there are only one chance that this user fail is true. That one chance is this default. Chance number one. What I am doing? I am going to ask the user to give me a number. If the user gives me a number that is not one to nine, the computer is going to ask again, give me a number. And if again, give me a number that is not one to nine, he's going to ask again, give me a number. And so on. The user can make mistakes. The only thing that you can do is check for the mistakes of the user. And usually, if the user make a mistake, the best thing that you can do is ask again. Put the user in an infinite loop, and the only choice that the user has to go out of the loop is to give you the information that you need. In this case, the only option for the user to go out of this loop is to give me a number that is inside of one to nine. Moreover, did you notice that I put here user fail true? By default, I am changing the, the false there and I am telling user you are wrong. Which is the only option for the user to go out of this loop? Making user fail false. What is the only chance for that? This. Not only choosing one number one to nine, also give me one number one to nine and only if that number represents a variable that before has a white space and therefore I can change that white space for an X, I allow you to go out of this loop. Clear. Are you telling me that all of this go here? Are you telling me that you have this loop here 
but also you're going to have a small loop here. And inside of that loop, you have a switch inside, but also inside of that e switch, you have ifs inside. Yes. A do while that inside you should start have another do while that inside have a switch, that inside for each case have ifs. And it's only the point two of my program. But again, we are reviewing statements that you know. The new challenge is to use all of that knowledge together to create a paper, a program. So far, makes sense. Initialization, the user move. And if you think about it, is the user is moving. I am not going to allow this to continue until the user move. Next step, the user do a movement. I need to check if this game have a winner or not, right? I mean, after the user do the movement, someone won, like the user is the winner. Step three. What is happening there? It's an if condition. Uh, can you identify the meaning of the condition? Variable A uh, is a character, right? Remember this operator, different, not equal, white space. The variable A is not a white space. And variable B is not a white space. And variable C is not a white space. And continue. Again, I am using three lines just to try to make you remember the table. But you can put this in one line or you can put nine lines. The enters do not, are not important. So, did you notice that what I am doing here is asking if all the possible spaces are different from white space? So what I am asking is if I have something like that one. Can you agree with me that this one is this condition in which all the spaces have something that is not a white space. Why is this important? Because if I do not have any other white space, the game cannot continue, right? I mean, this is the condition in which the game is over. The game is over. Do you remember that this instruction is inside of our loop? If the game is over, what I want to do is break. What is going to happen with that break? It's going to go out of the loop. What do I have out of the loop? The closing curly bracket of the main, which basically means the end of the program. So if this is the situation, Game over. Break this condition. Ah, you do not want to use the break. Hopefully you agree with me that well, it's very simple. Put this condition, big condition, there. Because it's the same, right? If you put the condition there, Condition false out. You need to change the difference from equal. You need to adjust the things. But the similar idea, compare that the spaces are not empty, could be use condition to stop the loop. Or you create an infinite loop 
And in some part of the program, you put the condition, you need an if, and the result of the condition is to run the break and the break put you outside of the loop. Different things to do similar solutions. Now, this was like hmm, easy, but the only thing that I'm doing is if there are the spaces, we continue with the game next the computer. The user move. I check that the game can continue. Now the computer is the one that needs to do a movement. Movement for the computer. I am going to put this loop here. Similar idea. For the user, I put that loop until the user give me a valid position. I am going to apply the same principle for the computer. I am going to assume that the computer can make mistakes. Why? Well, I have two options. Number one, I can use some kind of machine learning, artificial intelligence to make this computer to play tic tac toe in a really intelligent way, which is not our goal. So my computer is going to play tic tac toe randomly. Randomly. Yeah, it could be better. I mean, again, machine learning, state machines at least. There are better tools to teach the computer how to play tic tac toe. My goal here is just to show you if, else, and loops. So I am going to choose the easy way to play. And this easy way is like playing with a small key. My computer is going to do the following, and this is just one solution. Uh, Computer, there is this table here, and I need you to play in one of the positions. The computer is going to choose randomly, and I want to introduce this instruction here. If you read map from random, hopefully at this point, you read map, and you remember, ah, it's our friend, the library for mathematical functions. Random is an instruction. What do you think is going to happen with that instruction random, you are going to get a random number. Which random number? Something between zero and one, randomly. Zero and one, random. And I am using the same instruction to type, random. Give me a number between zero and one, randomly. What I am going to do is, because the computer is going to give me a number between zero and one, Zero and one. If my computer gives me a number between zero and 0 0.33, it's the third row. Uh, between that and 0 0.66, second row. Between that and one, third row. And exactly the same for the columns. 0 0.33, 0 0.66, and that to one. Again, it's one solution my solution because I want to show you the random because I want to show you conditions. There are other options and we're going to review one more option in the week A, hopefully. So for this case, if I do that, if I ask for two random numbers between zero and one and basically I want to implement this idea, well, can you check my ifs? All my ifs for you the red ones and the blue ones. Did you saw what is happening inside of those conditions? Uh, let's see, randomly for the X, 0.35, for the Y, 0 0.75. Those are the two values that I get randomly. So randomly, X, lower or equal to 0.23, mm, no. Okay, move here. Greater than 0.33, but lower than 0.66. Yes, that is my value. So I am here. For the Y, lower than 0.33, uh, no. Okay, greater than 0.33, but lower than 0.66, no. Okay, you are here. 
The verbs today have an if to select the row, and then inside I have an if to select the column. And at the end, what I am doing is selecting, okay, you are in the second column and in the third row. So this is the place in which you computer want to play, just randomly selecting one column and one row. And the only thing that I need to do is now run this line. And that line, hopefully it's familiar for you because it's like, for the variable F, notice that all the lines in gray color are the same. The only thing that changes the name for the variable because I need to identify A, B, C, D, e, F, and so on. I use one variable for each box. So in this case, the F, and I am checking that the space is empty. The same thing that I did for the user. Again, the only reason that I am doing this is because the computer is playing randomly. So randomly, the computer can select a place that is already in use. Maybe the computer used that place before, or maybe the user used that place before. So randomly, I am asking the computer to select column and row, and then I check if that particular place has a white space. If so, I put an O, the computer is playing with the, the circle, and then I declare the computer fail false, just like I did with the user. I am following the same kind of idea. All these lines are the same. The only thing that I change again is the name of the variable. Review this with detail. I put colors to facilitate the reading. This is my computer play. What is going to happen if the computer randomly select a place that is not empty? This while is going to make a look and the computer is going to receive random numbers, check if it's empty, random number, check if it's empty, forever, 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 until the computer is able to play in one empty space. Computer fail uh, equal false or equal uh, whatever is this compare the value of the variable. Computer fail is this Boolean variable that I have at the top. It's a variable that helps me to remember what is the status of the situation. And then the equal equal is to ask for the value inside of that variable, and in particular here to check if that one is true, right? If that one is true, I continue with the loop. When it's false, what is going to happen is I just go down to the instruction below this block. I continue with whatever follow. Uh, this is the do here. Hopefully it's on the screen. It's this orange do, and this is the Y for that one. Good. So again, these are the instructions that should be here, computer move. So this is a loop. I have a loop here for the user move a lot of ifs here, and then I have another loop here for the computer movement. We are almost done. The only thing that we need to do is the printing, again, that we already did the printing here with the initialization, so it's going to be easy. The important thing is we need to check if there is a winner. Can you explain to me how to check if there is a winner in the tic-tac-toe game? We need conditions, right? Use the similar idea that we follow to check if there was a game over. And yes, you are thinking like, well, someone can win with this line or this line or this line. Well, but also this line, or this line, or this line, or also the diagonal, or the diagonal. How many options to win? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And which are the conditions for those? 
well, conditions. What do you think about this? One, two, three blocks. One with the circles, one with the X, and something else. Did you notice what I am doing in this big if condition? If I have an here and here, but now I have big ones or if the variable a, a is equal to O and the variable b is equal to o and the variable c is equal to o three o in the same row someone won't right oh, another option or the variable d is equal to o and e and f i am checking the second line right another option or B, H, E, the next line. What about B one? A, D, and G. A, D, and G. Exactly. What about the diagonals? Maybe just maybe A, E, and E. Are old. Did you notice the use of this and to create this group of three and then the or to define another group of three? This block here is checking if the computer is the winner. Why the computer? Because the computer is the one playing with the O. If any of those options is true, any of them. I am going to print this message, you, the user, because basically the computer is the winner, so you are the loser, and break, game over. Obviously, if those are not true, I check the next one. And the next one, if you notice, is a copy paste. It's exactly the same, but now with the X. If I have a line or a diagonal or a column with X, you user, you are the winner because you are the one playing with the X. And break. And the example before, if no one is a winner, but there is no more white spaces, I check that again. This is game over, but no winner. The printing that we have before, use again. And if you put all of this together with this template, you have a tic-tac-toe game. And my homework for you, put this together and play the tic-tac-toe. You are going to notice your main is too big, really big. Because I am asking you to put six slides in just one program. But we're going to solve that next week. We need to introduce using more than one method in our programs now. So, any question? A lot of questions, but you need to work on this. Okay. So, guys, you're going to need this in a lab next week. So, please use this copy, paste, play with this, it's going to compile, use this, get familiar with the source code, okay? See you next week, thank you.